All right, so C++ is a programming language, right? What is programming language? You can write an app, write an application using programming languages. Any of the apps you are using, like the gaming, like the uh, banking systems, like the like the uh, any of the social medias, they are written in programming languages, right? So, and uh, C++ is a general purpose programming language because all these applications you can think of, they can be programmed using C++. So there are also many other general purpose programming languages, but I want to give a uh, contrary uh, example, which is a special purpose language. Uh, for example, it's called a SQL for database. If you have a large database and you want to search for something like a, give me all the student list who are registered for C++, these are something the SQL can do. They can write a very simple language like one line or two line, and you can access the database, give you the result. But instead, if you are trying to program using C++, I believe it will be 10 or 20 lines of code. So C++ is general purpose programming. For some special case, it may be not as efficient as uh, special ones, but as a general purpose programming language, it's very good. So there are also many other general purpose programming languages. Anyone knows any? General purpose programming languages? A programming language that can do almost everything. Any other language you know of? Python? Yeah, good. Java, yes, good. So as you can see, we, we provide, as your first semester, right? We provided this uh, fundamental courses that can you can use them to program any of the applications. And uh, it's also object oriented, but I, I will put a, uh, I will say it's half half, right? Some of the people getting used to the C style, they could still using the C style in C++. They, every program, almost every program you write in C, they can still run in C++. What I mean by running is you can using the same compiler the same platform, and they will still be able to run. And uh, it's different from functional languages. So some of the functional languages, they are trying to define something like the a, a, like an equation or a formula, and they are programming in different ways. So there are many other programming paradigms. So these are paradigms, object-oriented are called paradigms, procedural are called paradigm, functional programming are, are one paradigm. So nowadays, people are um, more familiar with the object-oriented and the procedural uh, programming languages. Because uh, as a human, we typically want to think of uh, instructions line by line, right? Execute the first line, execute the second line, execute the third line. That's also what will happen in C++. But when you are learning in the second half of the semester, you will know uh, structure all the all the related materials in one object would be much easier to uh, build a large, large applications. If everything is just line by line, uh, sometimes you will make some mistakes and uh, you will not be able to uh, make a large program robust. So object oriented is very important when you are trying to design a large uh, app uh, application. So C++, what is C++? It means C with classes. Right. So in the old C, it don't have a object-oriented programming, just the procedural. And uh, in maybe many, many, many decades ago, right, people introduced this uh, concept. But again, it's still very efficient and flexible. C is very, very efficient. We call it a lower-level programming languages, not lower-level, so-called. So it's it's very close to the hardware. You can directly manipulate the data in the hardware. So it's very efficient. And as C++, it's a little bit slower than C, but it's much, much faster than programming languages like Python. So that's what people are still using C++. And it supports many of the platforms, whether you are using Windows or Mac OS or Unix, you will be able to run these systems. But uh, uh, so last year, we are uh, requiring all the students to pro program in the Linux system because 
last year we don't have the OJ system built, so uh, we we are we are grading your home their homeworks uh, in our server. So we have to making sure everyone is using the same library. Although it supports many different systems, their libraries are slightly different. So if your program can run Windows, maybe sometimes you need to change a little bit so that it can run in Unix or Linux. So that's what happened in last year. But this year, because we are grading in OJ, you don't have to do that. You can program in, uh, in your systems. And then as long as you test in the OJ system, if it shows pass, it means pass. OK, so it will be much easier for you compared to the students in last year. So, uh, so C++ is already used in high performance computers and embedded systems where you want a very high performance or low power or something that, like that. So as you can see, this picture is, uh, is from last year, August, 2023. This is the popularity by Python construct uh, 30, 13%. And uh, C, 11%, C++, 10%, right? As you can see, the Python is still the most popular language in the because of the AI or machine learning. And people like to program in Python uh, because it's easy, easy to program, easy to debug. It has many libraries in AI systems that supports uh, Python, so people prefer that way. But a C and a C++, as you can see, I would typically consider these two languages as one. So if you're adding them up, the number would be actually larger than Python, right? It's The reason is because many of the older programmers like me, I'm still programming C++, or there are many libraries, existing libraries, um, they are written in C++. So if you want to make your life easier, you want to, for example, directly call their libraries you need to write in C++. That's a bad news because migrating the every old library to Python is very time consuming. And uh, one good thing is programming languages have very similar syntax, like for loop, right? If else, and uh, function calls, objects. So if you learn one, you can easily migrate to another. Maybe learn a new language in a few weeks. That's really possible if you knows one, right? And uh, because programming languages are evolving, like C++, nowadays people have argued that C++ are a language that's unsafe. It's, it's true, it, because you can directly access the memory locations. You can manipulate the, <clears throat> the pointers. So it's sometimes if they are, say, malicious guy trying to write a program, trying to attack your computers, they can easily do that. And your computers will be uh, cracked. So nowadays people propose some other language like a Rust, if you heard about it, R-U-S-T, Rust. They are trying to uh, trying to replace the location of C++, right? People have written the whole operating system in Rust. It's really, really a lot of work, but anyway, so you have to keep in mind, newer languages are, Newer languages are developed every day. So keep keep your mind uh, open so that you will get used to newer newer ones. So uh, does anyone know what are the areas that's still using C++? Anyone knows any area using Python? Right. It's easy, right? AI. So any area that's still using C++? Pardon? Robots, yes. Search engines, yes. Yes, developers, and also uh, games. Banking systems. Many of the systems that requires fast speed, you would prefer C++ over Python. Because Python is 100 or 1,000 times slower than this one. If your program runs in one, milliseconds, maybe Python runs in one second. So if you don't care about, uh, oh, so sometimes you don't care, right? R like running a uh, AI system, it takes one second, get the result. Okay, it's fine. Instead it's getting one milli milliseconds, you, you will never, maybe you will notice a slow 
a little bit difference, but it's not that much, right? If you open a uh, web browser, it takes one second. Yeah, I can tolerate that. But some of the areas, because you, you require the very low latency, right? Like the gaming, when you are doing one click, it has to respond to you very quickly in milliseconds, microseconds, something like that. So in that case, you need a very efficient languages like C++. And also because there are so many people writing the old libraries, so there are many large companies, they're still using C++ in the uh, famous companies, they're still using that. And uh, so I would ask the last question reversely. So because Python is, uh, is slower than, than C++, anyone knows why people are using Python for AI? No? All right, so it's more related to the hardware part. So because uh, the GPUs, right? Nowadays, the GPUs are coming out and uh, GPUs can run, for example, thousands or, or millions of threads at the same time. They are running multiple tasks at the same time. So it really doesn't matter whether you gain a little bit from C++ or Python. It's really about hardware advances. You can reduce the time from years to months or to weeks. Instead of using C++ or Python, you just reduce from seconds to milliseconds. It really doesn't matter. So people prefer to use an easier language like Python for AI tasks because the uh, hardware for AI tasks are uh, so good. They can have more benefits. Uh, the, the benefits from the hardware have already uh, overlap the, the 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 slower part from the Python. It's 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 that uh, issues. <clears throat> so let's look at what a C plus plus program would like look like. This is the exact program generated by ChatGPT, right? So as you can see, first line is about include some libraries. So what does library mean? Library means the code written by other people. You could also include some other libraries by your classmates. If your classmates write a very good program, uh, a library or a function, you want to use that library, use other people's code, you can just include other people's library. We will teach you how to do that. But uh, uh, remember, include just using other people's code. This is the IO stream, which is using for print and also for input, your keyboard input and your print. So as you can see, STDC out, this is the one of the uh, object or function written in IO stream. This library, it's for print something in your terminal. So that's what it looks like. And this is the int main is called a function. And we will talk that later. And int main is called, it's telling the machine, you should use the exact name called a main. This is the entrance, this is the entry point for the program. So you are, if you write a little bit more code uh, anywhere, your, your machine will entry exactly at line three because it's called int main. And you will run your code line by line. So these braces are the body for the main function. When you finish it, you're done. So if there's a code outside, they are never called by the functions inside. So other code are useless. So these are the functions and these are called the function bodies. We will talk about that later. And the return functions are for the functions. Anyway, so these are exactly what a program looks like. So this is basically using other people's library to print some string to the terminal. That's the job. So as you can see, a code, a C++ code or programming code is just a piece of text here. So you can use any text editor to write your code. It could be Word. You could also use Word to write your code. It just cannot run, all right? So what's below your applications? What's below your program? So this is the job of our first week. I want to tell you a little bit about the underneath the program so that when uh, maybe in a few weeks you know how to program, you will know what's happening in your machine, right? So first you will the, have the program. It's just a text. You can write it in Word, in any text editor. 
then you will have some compilers. So what is compilers? Compilers are something translate from C++ program to a machine code. So it's like I'm translating a language people could understand to a language a machine could understand. So that's the job of compiler. So compiler like the, typically we use GCC, G++, or Clan, or Clan++. So plus plus means for C++. If there's no plus plus, it means for the old C language. So this is a job of compiler. Then when you compile it to something machine can understand, it's still not runnable, right? It's still uh, just a piece of zeros and ones in your machine. So how can you run it? It's the job of the operating systems. They will load it into your machine, load it into your memory, then run it uh, one by one. Operating systems could control the hardware, could provide services, could manage the memories, and also scheduling tasks. For example, if you have a lot of applications running, who should run first? Right After a very small piece of time, it should schedule to another application to run. So because we only have one CPU, sometimes we only have one CPU, how can you get the feeling that all your programs are running? Indeed, it's just everyone run a piece of time, then just to do the scheduling so that you will get the feeling all the applications are running. And uh, underlying the system software are the hardwares. We have the CPUs are basically the running part of your computer. And the CPUs understand one type of language like Intel and uh, AMD, they understand x86. And ARM, they understand another piece of language. So every, uh, every CPU, they will have different, we call it instruction set. So you will need a different compiler for different machines, if our machines are different. For example, this Mac, because it's using, um, they, they are using M2 or M1, I don't, I don't remember, but uh, they are using ARM's structure. So their compilers are different from maybe your laptop, if it's uh, for Intel's uh, processor, right? So your compilers will be different. So uh, remember to download the correct one. And also we have the memory, uh, we sometimes call it uh, RAM. So it, it, it is used to store the temporary data when you are doing programming. And also IO is for input output. We sometimes call it IO. And a disk is for storing your, for example, your C++ program or your machine, machines program, uh, and also uh, many other files in the, in the system. So let's look at the very old model of a CPU. So again, everything I talk about will not be included in your exam. It's just for your information, All right? Starting from next week, we will discuss about the, the, uh, the related materials. So here is a machine looks like. It will have a memory unit. It will have a uh, computing unit. So every time it's interacting, it's a control unit. It's interacting between the memory and the computing unit. So let's look at how a program would look like. So for example, if we want to compute C equals A times B, we will say, OK, load something from some memory address. So here is a very important uh, part. It's very important because many of the students uh, will have trouble understanding pointers. They think pointers are the most difficult part for C or C++. But indeed, it's, it's not, that, uh, not that hard because if you understand the address, address are the pointers. So if you think, what are pointers? Pointers are some locations, your home address, right, in, in the memory. So you will tell the machine where to load the data. So for example, if A is inside uh, 100, this is the location for A, then you are telling the machine, okay, load the memory address 100 from memory to the computing unit, then it will load it. And how do, what's the next step? Load B from some address. So for example, if B is in address 1000, then load it into your computing unit. When these two numbers are ready, you can compute A times B, right? Compute A times B, what's next? And you can store the result of A times B to C. Where is C? The, uh, the computer needs to know the exact location, assuming it's a 500, then it will return back 
to the memory part. So this is basically the whole step to compute a, a program. So that's underlying the machine. You will see a memory, a, a computing unit. They are interacting with each other. And uh, so this is the, we could say, this is the machine code. Machine can understand. They only know where to load the data, how to do, uh, what's the operation you need to do, which are the two operands you want to get, and uh, what are the results you want to save to. So these are the basic uh, language for the machine. These are the language for us, right? We know what is C equals A times B, but this is the language for the machine. So compiler's job is to translate from your code into some code that the machine could understand. So that's basically it. That's very high level. If you look at the detailed complex one, it's okay you don't understand any of it. You just get a feeling. This is the some code we write. It means swap, swap two values, right? It says a swap, then a compiler would make it some uh, some language that the it's 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 still readable actually uh, for a people who understand hardware, but then it will make it to binaries. Binaries are the instructions machine could understand. So if you are trying to understand what's happening in the machine, it is what's happening, right? It will become zeros and ones. So in the very, very old days, people doing programming in a machine language, right? Zeros and ones. What they need to do is they have a piece of paper, punch holes, right? If it's zero, punch a zero. Oh, no, they don't punch. If there's one, for example, you can punch a hole. Then when you put it into a machine, machine could understand, okay, your first instruction is zero, 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 one, and so on, right? Then if I ask you to program in this way, you will say, oh, it's, don't, don't bother me. I, I don't want to learn programming, right? It's, it's, really, it's really tedious. And also you cannot write a very large program uh, using this way. So, but anyway, this is a, for the machines, it's basically binary code, binary numbers. And it's tedious, error prone. Whenever you punch a run, zero or one, it'll become a completely different instruction. So it's also processor dependent. If your processor don't understand this kind of instruction, you need to write a new one. But in, if you're writing this way, you, the only thing you need to know is change a compiler, right? It will generate the exact uh, binary code for your machine, it can run. So as time passed by, people think, wow, it's re really tedious. Can we make it easier? Then people come up with this kind of programming. It's called assembly. Assembly. Then this language, uh, they, they're exactly one-to-one -one mapping. For some of zero, they call it a multiply. For some of the zeros and ones, they call it adding. For some of them, they call the load data from memory and so on. So, but it's still processor dependent and it's just making the humans easier to read and easier to write. So that's the second part. And as we learn, we learn the highest level language, right? It's independent of the instructions, whether you support this language or that language in your machine, it doesn't matter as long as you have the correct compiler, it will generate the correct code for your machine. It can run on your machine. So it's independent of the underlying hardware. It's easiest for humans to read and uh, write. And these are this one. And as time goes by, what we can predict in the future? How can we write code in the future? Chat GPT, right? Why do we need to learn? We just ask chat GPT, okay, what's the problem? And then they can write a code for you. Maybe in the future, if, if AI is really smart, they can write a code. So the number systems are something you need to get familiar with, but you don't need to, I will not ask you this in your exam, but this one are very good to learn. So it's, uh, for example, our decimals or the typical numbers we learn are based on uh, base 10, decimal numbers, right? We have the characters basically from zero to nine. And uh, when it's 10, it means one times 10 plus zero, right? And uh, for the machines, because all of them are zeros and ones, 
they are using binary code, binary numbers. So here is what a binary number means. How can we convert a binary to a decimal? Uh, let me see if I can draw it. So in a decimal, right? In a decimal, one, one means 11, right? It means one times 10 plus one, right? One, one, one means 111. So it means one times 100 plus one times 10 plus one, right? So in a binary, every number is two. So this one is still one. This one means two. This one means four. Next one means eight. Next one means 16 and so on. And after the decimal, this number means one half. This one means one quarter, right? And vice versa. So if you say 101.01 .01 in binary code or binary number, it will become one times four plus zero times two plus one plus zero times half plus uh, one times a quarter, right? When adding them up, you will get the exact number. So this is a uh, converting between binary to decimal, and you can do the reverse from decimal to binary, but it's a little bit more tedious. Let's show, uh, let's see, how can I close it? All right. So we will have convert decimal to a, yeah, that's a typo. Convert decimal to binary, right? There are many online tools you can play with. You don't have to learn how to do that. What is five in binary? What is five in binary? 101? Yeah, 101. The, the last one means one. The first one means four, right? Adding them up is, is five. I'm not sure if they support a decimal. It also supports. So some of the, when you are learning the, when we go to the floating point, when we say, okay, what is 5.1 in decimal, right? It indeed contains more digits in the decimal, uh, in the binary. So because our machines store some of them, it will have limited uh, precision. So when you convert it back, for example, if you can only store the first few bits, when you convert it back, it will become maybe 5.09 or something. So when you are dealing with floating point, when we're talking about a floating point in the future lectures, you will know why it happens. When you convert some number to binary and doing computations, you will get errors. Because these errors are from this transmission, uh, this conversion, as well as some of the computations in the middle. So these are something you need to understand. Okay, so anyway, uh, I believe I have talked about too much in the in the period. So, any questions so far? Because last lecture, when I ask, is there any questions? No one asked any questions. But after class, they come here and ask so many questions. So, but uh, yes. Memory address. Okay. So, yeah. uh, by the way, you don't have to stand up. Okay. So, uh, I'm not sure if these people can see it. So, memory is like a is a is a piece of uh, data. So, it's like address one, address zero, one, two, three, four, right? Something like that. So. This is our memory. Memory is like a, uh, a street, right? This is your home address. The home address zero is Professor Liu. Home address one is Professor Liu, for, for instance, like that, all right? And the home address is TA1. This is a memory address. When you want to say, okay, I want to do Liu times TA1, all right? The machine knows where these guys are. This is your home address. 
they have a book to look up. Okay, these are this guy is in zero, this guy is in one. So when you are doing computation, they know, okay, this guy is in zero, but in your computer unit, you have to load it first. So I say load load address zero, memory address zero, then Luis in your computer unit, then load address two, then another TA is in the computer unit, right? This is your computer unit. Computer unit, so you have this guy times this guy, get a multiply, then get a result. This is basically the computer unit. This is the memory address, all right? Then you do this, you load it, then you assign it back, for example, to Liu, then your result would be, then do multiply, then you can store it back, store to address one. So these are the, uh, that not exactly, because it's a, it will be different from machine to machine, but here is just a very abstract level of understanding what are pointers. So in the future, you will learn the pointers of this guy is zero. The pointer of this guy is one, right? So. Yeah, that's basically uh, in the future when, when we talk about the pointers, you will learn about these are the memory locations, these are pointers, these are the instructions, and these are the computations. So yeah, uh, maybe it's 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 a little bit hard as the first lecture, but uh, it hopefully it will help you understand in the future. Yeah. Any more questions? Has anyone tested the OJ system? Anyone submit the, you have submitted? Did you pass? Yes. You can register an anonymous account using any name, any email. Okay. I would not suggest that because when we created the server, we have to specify how many users might use this because otherwise the system might down if there are too many users. So I would suggest other people don't register for it. If there's too many people accessing the same server, right, server will down. <clears throat> mm -hmm. No further questions about the grading, homework, assignment, lab. Ah, contest, you mean contest, OJ? Oh, okay. Yeah, so so we have one, one email, uh, I'm not sure receiving by which one? So asking if I already get the gold prize for some of the competitions in high school in programming, like NOI or something. I would I would say you don't have to go to the class, right? You don't have to go to the, uh, come to the class. But I'm not sure if the university would allow you to bypass the prerequisite for for the um, AI thrust because they require this one as they are mandatory. Uh, mandatory class, but uh, if you are good at programming, again, uh, you don't have to come to the class, finish the programming assignment, finish the lab exercise, you're good. Okay, it's especially for the people who are good at programming because it will be a waste of your time here, just learning the basic stuff. And I have the videos for last year, right? but it's really boring, I wish I would say because I, I need to cover all the basic materials. And you will see, I am basically follow the orders of your slide, of the slides. And you can go over the slides. If you can understand everything, it's fine. If you cannot understand some of some part of it, you can come here with your questions and ask me which part you don't understand. So I would know which part I need to emphasize. Yes. Uh, indeed, I don't. I would not recommend any courses here. <laughs> it's like 
uh, advertisement for a, for a commercial stuff. <laughs> but uh, but I would say the courses I I, pro I provide they are also for the undergraduate students. Yeah, some of the courses. It's it's still uh, on Canvas. You can check their link here. As you can see, it starts from CS one. Uh, CS one, I believe, it's for first year students. And if you are if you want to learn more about the simplest programming, I would say read the book. Big C++ is a very simple book. Uh, you can learn from the beginning. It has very simple things. And also there are many online resources. You can, the most important thing is practice. I would say programming is a, you can think of it as a, a skill. You need to practice every day. If you are new to it, practice is more important than taking classes. And I learn how to debug, learn how to, uh, in the future, I will teach how to debug a code, especially if you have the correct IDE, like the VS code, and also many other um, IDE installed, you could also uh, debug and uh, test your program and uh, writing something for fun. That's very important. Right. Any questions? Uh, so again, don't worry about the uh, OJ systems. If you haven't tried it, you could use the Friday's lab to do it. It has, uh, and also you can play with it for fun. But right now I only have one problem. Let me see if I can create a new ones. Wait a minute. I have some of the problems. As you can see, we created many, but some of them are maybe, it's it's too hard for you to play with. Anyway, I will make them available. Some of them are, uh, indeed, it, you can start them maybe after a few weeks, but these are just for testing purpose. You can write some of the wrong code you can see what their output would be. But the the thing is, like this one, right? When you submit, when the, wait, compile error, it shouldn't be compile error. Did I choose the correct one? Yeah. Yeah, you need to select your language because we support many languages. And if your answer is incorrect, it will show wrong answer. Oh, maybe this one I can see everyone's. So sorry, I cannot do that. Are there any my submissions? No. So we will be able to see your submissions. And we will be able to see your exact submission date. So if you are late, if you are late, you will never be able to submit your code here. And we will not allow late submission. We will not allow. Uh, so let me see. Oh, it, it, regarding the programming, we will have uh, maybe, for example, a small amount of grades for the programming styles. If your programming styles are good, you will get a full grade. If you put everything, the programming styles are bad, we will deduct some points. OK, but that one will be graded by the TA manually. Other than that, all of them will be graded by the systems. Yes. Uh, this Friday, this Friday. Yeah, yeah, this Friday in your lab zero. Yeah, they will be available. Yes. Yes. It's 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 just an example. As you can see, you can finish it in ChatGPT. Has anyone played with it? ChatGPT? Is there anyone don't know how to access ChatGPT? Don't know how to access it? No, all of you knows. 
this system is very powerful. You can use GPT-4, you can use chat GPT. It's just a different models. Anyway, it will give you the correct answer for this kind of simple questions. For these simple questions, you could also ask what is the, for example, correct grammar for to write a, a for loop, right? Something like that. They, they will also provide you how to run this program, right? Save the code, copy paste into some file, then compile the code, then run the program. All right, so what I typically do is I will run it in my server. So let me show you the last one. Mm. Where is the... All right, I typically program in my, in my uh, office. So I will have an office. This is the my office server. It's running Linux, and uh, I will have. This is the machine I remotely log in so that I can play with the code. So uh, some of the code you you don't have to remember it, but uh, I want to show you what do they mean by it. Save the code, right? Save the code to some file name called a CPP. You could copy codes, copy paste. Then uh, create a file called a hello.cpp. You can paste it. Then you will have the hello.cpp. Then if you want to run it, it is a like the G++ dash O, this cpp file, right? This is how to run this program uh, because my name is hello.cpp. So every Text code is in my hello.cpp, and I can compile it. As you can see, not only have the hello.cpp, this hello world is the binary code, the machine code. It, it is something the machine could understand. And if you can run it, it will print hello world. So this is called a terminal, print something to the terminal. All right, just a quick show of what do we mean, what do they mean by this? So most of the steps they will show in Linux. So if you want to do it, you need to uh, install something. If you are Windows, Windows WSL, install this one. So then you can access the Linux system in your uh, in your Windows laptop. All right, and uh, do it offline before the lab sections. <laughs> 